My dear brothers and sisters, we're hearing a lot of words like unprecedented, or we've never been in a situation like this before between Israel and the United States. Not so. This has happened before. We'll discuss here how Israel can successfully manage its relationship with the United States right now, based on Torah's guidance, as taught to us by the Rebbe. We'll see how each of these things we're experiencing now has happened before. And if you're familiar with history, you'll know that this is not new. It's only the details that change, but the template, it's the same. Actually, there are endless examples. The 56 Sinai campaign. Israel has a stunning battlefield victory against Egypt, but within a few months, hands away the victory and pulls back from the Suez Canal because of U.S. sanctions. 67, the United States was pressuring Israel not to strike preemptively. This is before the Six-Day War. That time Israel did not listen and had a stunning and by all accounts miraculous victory. 73 is the quintessential example of the opposite with the Yom Kippur War. On Yom Kippur morning, the U.S. ambassador shows up in the prime minister's office threatening and saying Israel dare not fire the first shot and cannot even call up the reserves. Israel folds listens to the United States and the absolutely calamitous disaster that follows, we all know. Thousands of soldiers killed, Israel's morale totally shot, and its deterrence done away with for many years to come. 78, Mifzah Litani, going into Lebanon to clear out many terrorists, an operation that got off to a tremendous start, very successful, but then due to very intense American pressure, turns into an eventual disaster because it leads to the 82 war, which itself was stopped due to perceived American pressure by Israel's uh, decision makers, and then turns into a quagmire on its own. So maybe this conflict is more public, but it's not at all unprecedented. And if you think about it, is President Biden worse than or more hostile than Carter or than James Baker? I think not. The entire Oslo Accords that we are so lamenting today that led to our handing over the keys to Gaza were begun and shepherded by the United States with tremendous pressure being placed on Israel. I remember those. It was in my time. The Rebbe was desperately trying to do everything he could to stop that. In this clip, Foreign Minister Eliakim Rubinstein is about to head off to a meeting with President Bush and Secretary of State Baker. So jeden mit die Repression in den United States, da hat man beweisen, man das Starke behandelt und behalten nicht, was sich noch eher niederfallen ist. Und sonst so noch, das war was anderes, könnte es nicht sein. Kommen ins Mann, aber es ist so, als die Sultan Azar oder sie hinter uns sehr heiß und sehr tief. Foreign Minister Rubinstein protests again and again, and he says there's so much pressure, you don't understand, such pressure from the United States, from Bush and from Baker and the Arabs, they're not understanding our position. The Rebbe is having none of it. I 
To be clear, the Rebbe's approach to the israel U.S. relationship is not, oh, let's just ignore America and do what you need to do, this isn't important. Not at all. It's a very important relationship. The Rebbe has 10 points based on Torah's guidance for how to handle this relationship, together with historic examples for each. Some of those are very relevant for right now. The foundation for it all, however, is the understanding that when something is a security concern, when we're talking about giving away a strategic advantage of any sort to the enemy, whether or not it results in life or death today, ultimately it will become just that. And you need to look at it that way now. And because of that, when you draw the line at any strategic advantage that you might be giving to the enemy, that's where you draw the line and you don't budge from there. Now that clarity and understanding that there are things that we cannot compromise on is the starting point. Now that you know you cannot make a certain move, how do we manage the relationship with the United States? Well, first of all, you need to explain yourself nicely, but then you can't budge. And if, God forbid, you do, two things are going to happen. First of all, you're going to end up with death, God forbid, either in the very near future or a bit later than that, but it won't take too long, God forbid. And second of all, they're going to look back at you and say, hey, you're liars. Yesterday you told us that this is life or death and you have no ability to compromise. And today you're walking away from this. So actually, you end up fracturing the relationship more by giving in rather than less. And the next thing that happens is this leads to the next step, the physics of pressure, that once you give in, you're just inviting more pressure. And this happens again and again and again through history. So those were, in short, several of the key pieces of the Rebbe's guidance on the Israel-U.S. relationship. There's a fundamental point here that we need to understand as well. America needs a strong Israel. There might be a particular president who's under pressure and we're always within a year or two of an election before us or after us. There's there's always one coming around the corner. There's a campaign and everybody knows how this works, right? But ultimately, ultimately, the United States needs Israel to be strong. It's not in U.S. interests for Israel to back off, God forbid, of its vital security needs. Now, when we understand some of these fundamental principles, and Torah helps us get that clarity to understand what's dark and what's light, where are the lines that we can't pass, where we can't compromise, the question becomes, how do we communicate with the United States? Or things like that. Not, should should we do this or should we not do this because we know what's, what's off limits. And then we're not so conflicted about what we need to do. Eiser, the Kasha, the Rebschel, the Zogplaut, is Gare, the Gay Kot, and Allah has come and come and the Gay God. And the Zesser, the Bain, the Bosser, and the Muzon, come and to the Zeri Geld and to the Zeri Neshek, and Hulu, and can do what come upon him, aim with Norgen, but in Zain Rachmon, and the Slan, and for so needs in the Geld and the Neshek. Der einzige Weg, was sie zu haben, dem Geld und dem Neschiko, nicht nur geben, ich beschaß mich selbst zu betechen. Wie man gesehen, bis ich sie war, die in die Kurde zu was er gestellt betechen, hat das nicht angerichtet, dem Geben, dem Geld und dem Neschiko, auf eine längere Zeit, mehr nicht, wie auf das Mann kurz ist, kurz man sie nicht mehr gewinnen, nicht geben, nicht geben, nicht geben, nicht geben, nicht geben. But at the end of the day, there is tremendous pressure. And how should Israel handle it? As the Rebbe explains, there is only one way to truly dispense with it all. At the time of this particular talk in 1979, the issue was about building cities around Israel's borders in order to protect them. But the approach applies to every situation. (laughs) 
בכל פונים בקהילה נס חלושו. המבט מחנה אישו, ומבט צר בזצן, ומבט פרגרסן, ומבט שתיים בחלף נפש דף מי גזיים, ומבט צר שתיים בתקן וכולו. אית ועשה הדיבור, ועשה הדיבור, וייסן דיפלומט נעשה הדיבור, אין נשאר וכלום. דין צקי וג, אף מבט על זין דמלח עציז, איז אופטו נא מייסה. ואז אפילו אזיד נעלים ואונבל חרוטון ואונזיד ואז נתקון נינטון ואולם סעזה ממייסי ואז נתקון נעזוב כי חרוטון נתקון Several years ago I spoke with a very senior Defense Department official about his conversations with the Rebbe, and he had many very, very long conversations focusing on the relationship between Israel and the United States. He says in general the Rebbe had two almost opposing approaches to the relationship. On the one hand, he said, don't get so bent out of shape by what the United States says. I'm reading from my notes here. Um, he says, don't worry too much because they won't let you down at the end of the day. But on the same token, he said, don't fight them. You need them. Negotiate in good spirits and good faith and don't get into brinksmanship or to a fight. Now, how do you pull off these two apparently opposing things? The Rebbe fe- clearly felt that they could coexist, and that's obviously the co- a combination of good diplomacy and good self-confidence. Another really interesting point, as the Rebbe explained to him, was how the United States works here, what the U.S. interest is. America wants this problem to go away as quickly as possible. That's their interest here. They're always going to apply pressure at the weakest point, and unfortunately, that point has almost always been Israel. But if we are unwavering, they'll try somewhere else. Another interesting bullet that I found is an explanation of what does it even mean that America is pressuring Israel? You know, presidents come and go. A specific president at a specific time and place has his domestic political needs, and he's pushing you to do A or B or C, depending on the situation, right? Be patient. Figure out a way to wait it out. He's acting under pressure of his needs as the President of the United States, and that's totally understandable. He's got his job to do. You, meaning Israel, you're going to need to live with the results of this. This talk is from 1986 about a decision made in 79 and 80, looking back at Prime Minister Begin's decisions under tremendous pressure from President Carter. <laughs> Om de wees werd ze gewend bij leegheid. Om de wees af hem en met leegheid gewend. We zijn gedaafd gehoord te hem. Van 50 jaar van zijn schieten. Ben de geest te bezorgen hoort. Ben de gekond best in de lachers. En dat gangen en gehaasmen tot dem papier. Wat skatter was toch niet gericht. Dat met het schaasmen in hem. Het is gemoest verwangen. Met zijn de lachers wat zijn gehad af zich. So what are we supposed to do right now? Torah does have an approach that has many more specifics than this short YouTube video. And I should note that it's a very compassionate approach that does not just say, oh, kill everybody who's in your way. The bottom line of it is this. We need to follow the guidance of military and security professionals And they are to answer one very narrow question, which is, what is going to lead to battlefield victory here and now, to tangible security now? What will result in securing territory so that we can have true security and peace? No other considerations may be taken into account, including even next week's arms shipment. This is the blueprint that Torah gives for how you make the decisions. So if you're going, if they say you're you're going into battle and they say you need to put your foot on the gas and go full throttle toward finishing an operation, you do it without stopping and you finish quickly. And that always tends to lead to less losses on either side, by the way, then that's what you need to do. And it's also important to note who we do not ask. We are not to ask politicians diplomats, former military people, the Rebbe uh, emphasizes, not people looking for where their career ladder is headed, only somebody who's sitting down and saying, 
this is what's going to save lives. We'll link a talk below from 82 in Lebanon where the Rebbe expresses and explains this approach. Now, I want to keep things positive, but I do want to address the flip side of this. If you do, God forbid, give in to the pressure, as Israel unfortunately has many, many times in the past, you, we, all of us will regret it deeply. It'll result in loss of life, God forbid, this particular talk is from 79, when the Rebbe is talking about the conclusion of the Sinai campaign, when Israel pulled out of the Sinai desert in, in 57. But the parallels are all over the place. The Rebbe actually concludes this talk with a really amusing anecdote about an insurance claim. We'll link it below. It's time to wrap this up, but I just want to conclude by saying something the Rebbe said so many times. When we do what we need to do, when we do the mitzvot, and most importantly, the cardinal mitzvah of defending and protecting Jewish life, God then blesses our efforts with miraculous success. So when a situation looks scary and we do what we need to do, the Torah tells us defend and protect life, and we do that, we will see that everything falls into place. So it's a really interesting paradox. On the one hand, we say God gives us miraculous protection. But on the other, he demands that we do everything in our capability to defend ourselves through natural means. So it could get a little dicey here and there for a little while. But every time we've made the right choice to go out there and defend ourselves, when we haven't worried about what the world says, in the end we were successful on the ground and the world was impressed and respected us as well. Fulfill the mitzvah of protecting yourself, and God will continue to protect his children as he has for 3,000 plus years. I want to thank Levik Kor for helping me put together this video. And let's end with a happy clip from Purim in 1972. <laughs> Das ist mein Haus.